Roxana, apenas comienzo a compartir en, en, en YouTube, te mando el, el link para que lo compartas en las redes, por favor. Ok, ok, ok. cada domingo a las 6 de la tarde. Joel Guerra y Yael Aguiar con las incidencias de deporte más visto del mundo. La Fórmula 1. Además, las últimas noticias del automóvil y el modo de coche. Domingo, 6 de la tarde. Roxana, ya estamos en vivo en YouTube. Esperamos un momentito. Ok, Gabrielita, ok. Ok, ya estamos compartiendo en vivo por YouTube y también estamos compartiendo en la página de Perú Tech eh, en vivo. Así que ya podemos, creo que, iniciar. A esta hora tenemos... No, vamos a esperar un poquito porque todavía no son las 8. Así que por mientras, eh, quería invitarlos también a seguir participando en nuestros eventos. Eh, voy a hacer mi cherry por mientras, eh, desde Asesoría Educativa 1. Eh, los invitamos a participar eh, de este viernes. Tenemos una, un taller pequeño, pero es cómo hacer tu libro digital. Y para mañana también, eh, Miguelito, mañana tenemos a Jennifer Alicea desde Puerto Rico. Va a estar con nosotros eh, dándonos un tema sobre el burnout. Eh, Interesante. El síndrome del quemazón. Así que estás invitado y ya les voy a mandar la invitación. Ya les mandé la invitación al grupo de Cristo sí. International. Así que espero verlos por ahí. Gracias. You're very welcome.
one minute left and we start. Yes, Mr. Carranza? Perfect, yeah, fine with me. Okay. Your call is forwarded to an automatic voice message system. Seven, seven, two, six. Well, good evening, everybody. It's nine o'clock in Dominican okay. Republic. Okay. Good evening, dear Mr. Miguel Carranza from El Salvador and dear teachers. Today is the date. We express our gratitude to Mr. Carranza for his patience, time, energy, and passion for sharing knowledge with us today. Okay, so the topic that he's going to cover tonight is helping students love reading and improve their English in the process. Okay, so let me introduce Mr. Miguel Carranza from El Salvador. Mr. Miguel Carranza has a college teaching experience at Universidad de El Salvador for more than 25 years. He has a master's degree in science of education through a Fulbright scholarship in 2001, University of Kansas. He holds a BA in English from Universidad, from Universidad, excuse me, from Universidad de El Salvador. He is the former coordinator of the BA in English language teaching and former coordinator of the masters in translation. He has participated as a speaker at Universidad Don Bosco, Centro Cultural en Universidad de El Salvador. Two, five. Well, there are, uh, sorry for the interference, okay. He has participated as a speaker at Universidad Don Bosco, Central Cultural en Universidad de El Salvador. TISO, Mexico TISO, 2010. Panama TISO, 2014. Honduras TISO, HELTA, 2018. Bolivia TISO, BETA, 2019 at Universidad Libre Colombia 2020 in, a, in public and private institutions of the country in the last year. Fue lo primero que yo hice, pero les vuelvo a repetir, tampoco no quería hacer todos los webinars yo sola, así que pido apoyo y, es, y en equipo trabajo. Wait, wait a minute. También le agradezco a Kinga Thompson, oh. que nos ayudó en este caso wait con Sherry Martin Oxford, que fue uno de los que tuvo mucho. I don't know what happened, there is a participant here that is making noise. Tuvimos también a Mansur Mansuri, que también nos apoyó body language, the importance of body language. Okay. Please. Sorry for the interference. So tonight, Mr. Carranza is with Peru Tech members and let's give him big applauses. So go ahead, Mr. Miguel Carranza. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for this Thank uh, warm welcome. Wait a minute, teacher Carranza. Please, dear teachers, could you turn off your microphones, please? Thanks a lot. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Rosanne. Thank you, Gabriela. And also thanks to uh, Gracia Mendoza from Honduras, who um, invited me to participate in these uh, international conferences you've been having. I know you've been working hard. And it's a pleasure for me to be here sharing my ideas uh, in my experience as a professor, and particularly um, in the teaching of reading, which is not a, a difficult, uh, not an easy task, I would rather say. Um, let me start sharing my PowerPoint with you. You can, hope you can read it. And it's about, yeah, helping students love reading. I know it's a, 
I know it's a catchy uh, title, and it's a difficult uh, thing to achieve uh, to um, help students love reading because to develop a love for reading, that's a, a very personal thing. It's a very um, challenging, but at the same time can be rewarding. So I'll share with you ideas on how to uh, help students uh, improve and develop a pleasure for reading and improve their English in the process. That's my name, that's my email address. If you wanna contact me, if you want a copy of the PowerPoint or, or references for some uh, books or sites where to get them, right? Okay. <clears throat> so tonight, uh, this evening, we will um, share ideas and in my experience on how to help students improve the language proficiency in English and love reading. Because I'm a big believer that uh, through reading, students can improve their English, their general proficiency. Um, I'll make uh, strong arguments in favor of uh, this, this idea, which is called extensive reading, extensive reading uh, programs in the EFL class. And I hope I also motivate you to read more in English or in Spanish, or in both languages, why not, right? Now, it's, this is like a, like a warning or, or I should, uh, yeah, I, I, should rec I should acknowledge that this presentation will focus on, uh, on teenagers and college students who struggle with reading in English, who struggle with reading. This presentation um, will be about them. It, I will not talk about those students. Uh, uh, this will not help you with students who are good readers. If they are good readers, maybe some of the ideas can help you. But this will focus more on those who have not developed the habit yet, who do not have the habit of reading yet, and those who haven't found the book yet, as they say, as, as an assistant once told me, sometimes uh, you find the book or the book finds you, the book that will help you uh, develop passion for reading. Okay, so I'll focus on, on these students who haven't developed the habit, who haven't improved, uh, who don't have a good reading uh, rate. And I need to also recognize or acknowledge that I have taken ideas uh, from these uh, TESOL presentations or this, um, uh, it was a special uh, program. It was thanks to the American Embassy and to the Department of State, they awarded this uh, scholarship to attend the TESOL uh, conference in Portland. And I attended this particular session uh, by Doreen Edward, Sue ba Bae, and Bob uh, Patrick, professors and, and Kind of motivate me to expand this idea and I, and I share many of the things they presented. So I will uh, be based on some of my talk on, on this, this idea. So I need, I need to award, uh, recognize that, acknowledge that. Um, to begin, sort of a warm up, uh, maybe you can help me answering in the chat. How much do you or your students read either in Spanish or in English in terms of hours a week? How many hours a week? do you read in Spanish or in English? <clears throat> and I ask that question because um, I think that uh, our students, uh, particularly in our countries or in my country, um, reading is not very strong. Uh, some of you have already answered in the chat. Um, let's see if I can find it. Yes. Um, Let me see, I, this semester I haven't practiced with Zoom, I just practiced with Meet. Um, okay, but I, yeah, I was asking you about the time or the number of hours that students um, spend time, right, uh, reading. And I also had this, um, this other question. There was this study done in my country about high school graduates reading comprehension ability in Spanish. It was high school graduates. And they did very poorly in this test. There was a 50% of accuracy uh, of students in this uh, test. So they didn't read very well. They did not understand the main idea. So it, my point is if they have this problem in Spanish, they will tend to um, also translate this Okay, okay, Rosanna reads two to uh, three hours, uh, two to three hours, okay, that's a pretty good hour, a week, right, a week. I think it also counts uh, even what you read on the, on the internet or on your cell phone, one or two hours, okay. 
Good evening, at least two hours. Okay. But how about your students, the students you teach? How many hours do you think they read? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. It's something we should be um, exploring, right? Because I think if they read a lot, like I was giving a conference recently to Nicaragua, and there was a student who he said he would he would read uh, um, probably three hours or four hours. So I, don't, I think it was three hours a day. That was a lot of reading he was doing. So I was telling you the situation in my country is really bad in terms of reading, but like I said, it's not in all the cases, not in all the levels. You know, in some private institutions do very well, but generally speaking, right? This is a general test. But what are some of the common problems that students present when they are reading? And you will probably agree with me with some of these uh, five uh, common problems that students have when they, um, when they tackle a reading. They read word by word. Uh, they rely too much on their visual information and this impedes their, their speed, right? They're reading word by word, they're trying to pronounce it, and this affects comprehension. They focus too much attention on the form. They are trying to find out if this specific word is an adjective, or if this uh, word is uh, a noun or a verb, whatever, right? They're trying to, to find out what the function of the word is or, or yeah, what is the part of speech the word plays. Okay, um, they pay too much attention to details with the result that they often miss the main ideas and they only see the trees instead of the forest. They tend to focus sometimes uh, on grammar too much instead of the main ideas. Number four and number five, I think I've also, I also have seen that with my students. They have a small reading vocabulary and they depend too much on the dictionary uh, for word meaning. I have a teenage uh, daughter, have a teenage, and, and sometimes she's reading in Spanish and she asks me for the meaning. And sometimes I help her, but sometimes I wish she, she would uh, try to get the meaning through the context, right? But then I, I, I give her a, a hand. Um, number five has to do with the, like, sort of what they call cultural capital, uh, limited background knowledge. Students don't know much about what they read it's because they don't read or they do, do, do not have a lot of information about the topics they read. As I was preparing for this presentation, I remember once in the TOEFL section, in the reading section of the TOEFL, there's, uh, there are some readings, for example, about caves, about caves. And, and there were, I think, two types of caves that were uh, underwater, under the water and underground. And there were some differences. And like, and like that was the first time I was reading that. And, it, and the reading, I felt a little bit complicated or challenging because it was something I didn't have any background knowledge about it. So when, when we don't have background knowledge, we don't have any information, so the reading becomes more difficult. And uh, yeah, well, we, we probably we will not get the main idea. So those are some, some of the five uh, main problems that students face when they're reading. But what is reading? You should, you, will, you probably have seen this definition that I will show you. You probably um, have the answer to this, but let me refresh. Uh, your, your memory about what reading is. And I like these definitions because it says reading is a constant process of guessing, a constant process of guessing. So it's, uh, you see, reading is uh, active, right? And what you bring to the text is more important than what you find. So uh, background knowledge is very important, right? This uh, knowledge is very important for you to understand the reading better. That's why from the beginning, the students should be taught how to use what they know to understand unknown elements. And that's why it's important to build background knowledge right? or, or to hit their background knowledge. I also like this other definition by uh, Yun Meijin that reading is a psycholinguistic guessing game. Psycholinguistic, you know, it's a, we have to use our brains, right? And we have to use also uh, the language uh, or the knowledge we have about the language. So it's a psycholinguistic guessing game that involves an interaction between thought and language. Um, reading involves processes or, or cycles of sampling, predicting, testing, and confirming. So when we read, we have to do this. Our, our learners, our students are supposed to be 
making predictions, right? As you remember about these uh, reading techniques, reviewing, predicting, uh, guessing word meaning, scheme, scheme, scheming, scanning, right? Okay. As we become fluent readers, we learn to rely more on what we know, right? The, the background knowledge. And uh, what is behind the eyeballs, less on, on, the, on the page in front of us. So reading is an active skill, although we have heard that reading is passive, but no, you know, reading is it's a, it's a mental process. It constantly involves guessing, predicting, checking, and asking oneself questions. Right? So we have to be asking ourselves questions uh, when we read or, or our learners, we need to teach them uh, to do that. So let me also present or share with you uh, what a reading model um, involves, right? I just I just told you some of the ideas, um, but uh, a reading model will include first student take a look at the pictures, take a look at the uh, the heading, take a look at the title, title of the book, title of the reading, take a look at that. Right. So start activating your background knowledge, start activating your brain, and then making hypotheses, the prediction. Right. What is this book about? What is this presentation about? What is this article about? Is he in favor of this author? Is he against vaccines? Is he in favor of vaccines? So we have to be active when we read and we have to teach that to our learners. We have to, this is like I said, one model, right? And we need to sort of anticipate where we will find the answers or confirmation to our hypothesis, maybe in the second paragraph. And you know uh, that at the end of a paragraph, well, you should have sort of a summary. At the beginning of a paragraph, also you, should, you have important information. So it, learners should be able to do that, right? Learners, we have to teach them to do that. Um, they have to skim yeah, through the passage, read the first uh, lines, read the last lines, read the conclusion. Sometimes you don't have to read the whole paper, but you have to go just to the conclusions, right? Just to get the main idea or to understand what the text is about. And then, well, number five, it's important you confirm or reject your, your guess, right? You, you say, yes, yes, this uh, book is about that. Yes, I was right. This, uh, yeah, the author is in favor of, of vaccination, for example, or the author doesn't agree that the vaccine will help us, will cure us all. And so that's what you will do when you when you get to, to the, this confirmation stage. Then more predictions, right? More prediction. And later, right, if students have time, do a second reading of the book or of the article that students were supposed to do. Particularly, but this would be more for um, uh, intensive reading for, for work done in the class. Right? Another model also uh, is known as SQ4R. And this means survey, survey meaning take a look at the title, take a look at the, at the number of pages, take a look at the chapters, get an idea, right? Then start making questions. What do you think the book will be about? What do you think the main idea is? Do you think the author is in favor or against? So learners have to do that. They have to um, ask questions constantly, right? They, they read, uh, recite, sort of uh, summarize, right? What they have read. They, they try to make connections. And then the other R will be for review, sort of uh, check everything look for an organization of the, of the article, of the reading of the book, right? So that's another model. Like I said, we had the first one, but all of them involve uh, preparation. All of them are trying to activate the student's uh, brain or mind or the background knowledge. But now that was a little introduction to my topic, but now this is probably uh, what I wanna focus on. What is extensive reading, right? What is extensive reading? And uh, briefly, or in a summary, is reading large amounts of self-selected, easy, varied, and interesting material. So it's reading a lot, 100 pages, 200 pages, 50 pages, probably um, taken, to, be taken into account. But students supposedly should uh, select it. Should be easy at the beginning, I, I would say, and then varied and interesting material right, that the learners like. That, that's the definition. Um, what are the goals of uh, extensive reading? What are the goals of extensive reading? 
The idea is to fluently read massive amounts of comprehensible language within one's comfort zone to build fluency while consolidating language knowledge. So the idea is for the learner to read, to read uh, one, two, three books per semester, ideally, right? And the idea is also to, de to, have, to develop a love for reading so, so learners can develop this uh, love, passion for reading, pleasure for reading. That's uh, one of the main ideas. And they can do it at their comfort zone. Uh, this is very important, comfort zone. We should not push them or should not be giving them very difficult uh, material or books when they are not ready. So they, they, feel, they build even confidence while consolidating language learning. What are the benefits? There are many benefits of extensive reading, not emergency room, but the extensive reading. What are the benefits? Um, students become better readers, obviously, right? Students uh, understand better. Students understand the main idea. They can summarize. They can uh, tell you the main idea fairly quickly, and they can read uh, faster. Another um, benefit of extensive reading is students become more confident. Yeah, they feel good, right? They feel they're learning. They feel they uh, can answer. They can um, read anything, for example. Right? Um, another benefit is that the learners have a better reading rate. Right? So they read uh, faster and they read more efficiently. They will probably get better scores in the, the standardized test. They will probably get better scores in the reading section of the top of the top or whichever test they take. Have increased motivation to read, it's another um, benefit. And I have seen that with the student, right? We ask them to read sometimes in the class and then, and then later they are reading on their own other books. So we have achieved something positive. We have increased their motivation to uh, continue learning. Their imagination, yeah, that's true, uh, Ana Beatriz, yeah. Imagination is a very important, and I, I haven't mentioned it here because these are more linguistic, but still, mo mo uh, imagination is a very important uh, uh, benefit. Um, let me see, okay, oops. Develop richer vocabulary, and that is true. I have seen that uh, students who read or, or practice more or, or have this exposure it could be uh, particularly through written. I see them using um, more expressions, uh, better expressions or long, larger expressions. And uh, so they develop richer vocabulary, develop positive attitudes towards the new, toward the new language. Yeah. There are four more benefits. Another benefit is, okay. Have increased uh, motivation to learn the new language. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about that. Improve language uh, proficiency in general. If uh, they read uh, better and they improve vocabulary, they will probably, um, actually it's number 10 is, you'll probably write better, right? When sometimes you can copy or imitate style, their uh, particularly uh, writer's style. And yes, Ana Beatriz, it, um, opens the world to them and they can get different points of view. Yeah, that's totally true. Uh, improve listening and speaking, write better. I, I think I, I myself an example of that. Uh, when I was asked, was asked to read uh, extensively a lot, eventually I started writing uh, or I started copying or imitating the models of the author I was reading, particularly when it was more of academic uh, writing. So, so we have to expose the learners to a lot of uh, reading. Okay. Okay. Extensive uh, reading learners do as well or better than non-extensive reading learners in the short run, right? So they do better, a little better, but in the long run, extensive reading learners do better. Now this is based on research, right? I told you the the presenters I what that motivated me to continue working on this topic. So they presented this and they said that this information is based on on research. And I have also, based on my experience, I also agree with them, right? This is, this is true. Now, what is the difference between um, extensive reading and intensive? Intensive reading is what we do in the classroom. Intensive reading, we do it inside the classroom. Out extensive reading, we uh, 
the idea is that it should be done outside the classroom, right? In intensive reading, the students uh, just reading accurately for main ideas, um, for specific information, right? Extensive reading, they do it uh, to, to improve fluency. Intensive reading, the students answer um, study questions, some questions that, that we teachers sometimes ask. And in extensive reading, students get information uh, for their own pleasure. Students focus on, on words, on the pronunciation, yeah? sometimes the grammar. And the extensive, they focus on the meaning, right? And, and the whole, uh, it would be the whole um, discourse at the discourse level. In terms of material, intensive reading, the teacher chooses, right? Sometimes it's an often difficult material. In the extensive reading, the, the students are supposed uh, to be choosing the material and are supposed to be choosing sort of this material. Material that they feel comfortable with. It doesn't have to be easy always, could be a bit challenging. The amount of time, the amount of reading, well, in the class is not much, one or two pages. In the extensive reading, they can read a lot. They can read the uh, books, as I, I was telling you, right? In the class, the students tend to read slower because they want to focus on accuracy. They, they want to get the correct answer. In extensive reading, they should be reading faster because uh, they, there are no specific questions to answer, unless they're, they're, it's used for a quiz or something. Um, used, uh, must use, must finish, they have to finish the reading and they, have, they, they use the dictionary for um, checking meaning of the words. And in the extensive reading, if students don't like the book, they can choose, they could choose another book, right? That's when they read it for pleasure. And Beatriz said they have time, they have to read the same text more than three times. Yeah, that's true. And when it's uh, intensive. Characteristics of an extensive, extensive uh, reading program, right? If you, if you decide to work one, if you don't have it, right? Uh, they say, well, the materials should be easy. You know, actually this, this uh, in my institution, in my university, we use it with college students, um, but uh, we don't have it like this, but we have, uh, we have some courses on reading and we have tried uh, to have a systematic uh, experience. So this, we have uh, like a series of books that I will present later, not that easy, but, uh, but if you could create like a little library, that would be great. I know it's difficult even to find books, right? But okay, students read as much as possible is one of the characteristics of extensive reading. There's a variety of materials on a wide range of topics. Students select what they want to read. They have the freedom to stop. You can get magazines if you could, right? You can have, a, like, like I said, a reading um, a session or reading, um, it would be like reading, reading corner, right? That could be an example. Uh, the purposes of reading are usually related to pleasure, information, and general understanding. So these are characteristics of an extensive uh, reading program. If you choose to establish uh, one. Now, my experience um, with ER, or as the one that is as close as ER, I think it's been systematic. I've been, I've been doing it for the last uh, 10 or 12 years that I've been teaching this course called Readings and Conversations. Um, okay, what is, um, oh, okay, here. There is a great potential of extensive reading, extensive reading. My students have done created bookmarks. They made created bookmarks that contain book reports. They have um, done movie posters based on books. They have had book chats uh, and classic book presentations. I will also show you some ideas that uh, what the students have done in classes, but these are students who are in uh, B1 or B2 level. They're gonna be teachers of English. That's what's been done at the university, but it can be done at different levels. Now, this is an example of a bookmark, right? Um, they, they, have, they create the bookmark and on the back of it, they can write uh, the title, they can write the author, information about the author, a little summary or these uh, general questions in literature, uh, the setting, the main actors, the main, the main character, sorry, the main characters, um, the setting, the conclusion, even their own opinion about the book. That's, uh, that's my 
example of using bookmarks. Um, I have seen students also after finishing the courses, they start reading the, the real, um, the, the, the books by Harry Potter, authentic uh, books by Harry Potter. And they can just send one example of a book cover or a, a Jack book cover. And these are some of the things they, they would have to write after they read the book, right? First we ask them to read the book and then they do this, uh, they do these tasks. Okay, they can create a book cover. The, the, the elements, what we ask them is, yeah, the title, the author, um, or they can even, um, yeah, who the, the illustrators, or can, can illustrate the book as well, can come up with a new one, um, or any information, right, about the book. They can create like a movie poster. And, uh, okay, here, I think I have the, oh, oops. These are options for book reports that we have asked our students to uh, do in the class. After they read a book, we ask them to do a live performance of Masterpiece Book Review. It's like a program and uh, which reviews the book that they have read. Supposedly they inter, well not supposedly, but they, in they, they were, they're supposed to be interviewing the, the author of the book. So they have to find information about the author. Uh, and they can analyze it from different perspectives. Sometimes uh, students pretend to be psychologists or teachers or lawyers, right? You can have uh, audit participation. The students write questions uh, for a character in their book, focusing on the element, elements of the story, the setting, the conflict, climax, resolution. And the questions are answered in the character's personality. That's one uh, idea, having a, a live performance of a masterpiece book review. Very interesting. Uh, number two is also make a uh, living history. Students dress up as a character from their book and they tell the story in the character's voice, focusing on the key plot elements of conflict, climax, and resolution. I remember we once uh, they talk about uh, this girl from Pakistan, Malala, Malala, I think is her name, and, and they dressed up as a as a, as, a, as a little girl from there, some of the girls and, and they, some others as their father, the teacher. It was a very interesting uh, book discussion we had. And they had to prepare for that. They had to read the book and they had to prepare uh, for this task. So it was interesting, a very interesting uh, book report, let's say. Another one is to create, I think it is uh, number three, it had to do with the, uh, yeah, it's a museum. Like they bring eight to 10 uh, 3D items they have chosen from the story to be part of a museum. They display them and they, they, start, they start talking about them, uh, what the objects mean, mean to uh, them um, as if they were, this was uh, exhibited in a museum. Uh, what, one of the tasks was the first uh, group will work with the first half of the book, the other second group, when, when, when the book was, when the class was big, they would be working with the remaining half. But this was also very interesting. It's a, a museum, a very interesting uh, task. I uh, have uh, two or three more tasks that we have used in the university. And yeah, my colleagues are also very creative. I like the, the timeline, um, making a timeline of the major events of the book. Uh, with illustrations, that one was very interesting. Uh, students draw themselves and they make uh, the illustrations and then they start talking about uh, Sometimes they draw a map showing the locations where the story, the, the story took place. And they, pre they prepare to explain it to their classmates. These are the, sort of a, like the general instructions that I, that I give them. Number five is uh, to construct a diorama. diorama. And here is the definition of a diorama. Um, do you know the word of diorama in Spanish? You can write it in the chat. Um, it's a blueprint or what the architects, what the architects build, right? It's like a plan. They build. Different, huh? yeah. Cathy Lisbeth, oh. Cathy Lisbeth, yes, I agree with you. Yeah, okay. Number six, create a follow-up story for three important characters in the book. A representation of the possible sequel should be presented through creative a series of. So they, they have to be creative and they can uh, think of a new chapter for the book. And they have all these interesting things too, right? 
Um, these were tasks, like I said, for this particular class that, that I've been teaching. Um, another uh, timeline, the most important events in the book. Well, what, what's different here is that at the end, the teacher could ask them questions based on the book just to make sure that they have also read the book. And the whole task shouldn't last more than 12 minutes. Like I said, these, these were uh, B1 or B2 uh, learners, most of them. But uh, you may be wondering, okay, which books uh, should I use? Now there's this definition and uh, I have used uh, graded and non-graded uh, texts. What do I mean by them? Okay, these are some of the titles that I have used. Uh, officially, that is very funny. Yeah, my cousin Rachel is a little funny. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, you probably know it. There's a version in Spanish, but it's very interesting with a good message. There's Frankenstein and others uh, which are uh, graded, graduados. And there's these others which are authentic, look like Tuesday with Maury, Animal Farm, which is, which is also one of my favorites. Then we have The Alchemist by Polo, Polo Coelho. Yeah. Um, there's this also, this other, in, before I, before I uh, begin showing you the books or some other books that I have started using, I want to remind you of this um, this term that authors, many authors recommend, is I minus two for extensive reading. I minus two input minus two. What is what does I minus two mean? It means we should be giving the learners material that is not that difficult for them, particularly for that learner who is struggling, right? If you have good learners, if you have uh, students who are very strong, academically speaking, give them those uh, books, those authentic books. But if you do not have those students who are very strong, do not give them just yet, because if not, we will frustrate them and they will get this trauma. Uh, they will have developed this, this trauma. We don't want that. We want to make reading pleasurable. And th so that, that many experts say, well, we should use uh, this idea of uh, giving students uh, input minus two in terms of reading, right? So that reading shouldn't be that difficult for the learners. They should uh, enjoy it. They should develop fluency. They should develop confidence as well, right? But like I said, I, I meant the teenagers and the college students who, who didn't have, um, who have, have not developed the habit of reading, okay? That's what I mean. Now, these are some examples of um, graded readers. I know these, these are from Macmillan. I, I have used some of them, but also um, Cambridge also presents the readers. Also, there, there are other editorials. I mean, all, all the editorials have the reader sections. And um, some of them are based on, on books. Some others uh, are, have worked written by some of their um, editors or their uh, authors. But anyway, so these are the examples of graded readers. These are not uh, the ones used by native speakers, but they come from the original books. Like we have Robin Hood. Uh, here we have Robin Hood, but it's not the original Robin Hood, but it's a shorter version, uh, sort of a, a bridge version of the book. It, it has been graded for, certain, uh, for, a cer for a certain learner. We have Macbeth here, Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Um, we have A Sense and Sensibility by Jane Austen, right? The idea is to motivate the learners, to make them feel that they are reading, and little by little, we will take them and then that we will um, expose them to authentic books or other books. Okay, these are the greater readers, and these are some of the greater readers I have used and uh, from the different editorials. Okay, somebody is asking for the attendance list, which I know is important. Um, okay, recommended, these are some of the recommended graded readers, right? Los libros graduados. The Black Cat, this is for basic. Elephant Man is also for basic, for uh, A1, A2 learners. Scarlet Letter, two, probably A2. Officially dead. Yeah, it could be somewhere between A, A2 and B1 learner. How I Met Myself, the, double, the story of the doppelganger, another interesting story. This one is also for, um, I think it would be for an A2 or B1. My Cousin Rachel, B1. The story of Nelson Mandela. 
I happen to get a copy of a copy of this. Uh, very interesting, probably for a B1 or a B2 uh, learner, The Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz is also, it has become, has, be, has been turned into a great, and there's the original book, of course, and even George Orwell's book, uh, 1984, uh, was has, has been modified, has been turned into a greater reader. The idea is to uh, motivate the learner. Hamlet or Macbeth, as we saw uh, in the, the picture, uh, they have been turned into these greater readers. And the idea is to um, to expose the learner to a lot of these uh, readings. Now, there's this series, I hope you're familiar with them, um, The Wimpy Kid. It's uh, supposedly for children, but it's uh, very funny. It's a very funny book. I, I started reading the first uh, three or four books. Then I got the collection, some of the collection for my daughter in Spanish, because I want her to, I want to motivate her too, right? To develop uh, a love for reading. I I'm not, haven't uh, achieved it completely yet, but I don't want to push her too much. But still, this is a very funny book. Um, it has vocabulary, yeah? has a lot of vocabulary, some simple grammar, simple sentences, but still it's very good to motivate the learner. And although it's for children, I think it could also be used for, for with teenagers and young adults, sort of an extra reader. Now, these are some of the, um, the books, the, the authentic books uh, we have used in the classes and they have done the tasks. Uh, one is Animal Farm by George Orwell, that one, although, can be challenging. It's a classic, right? In the in the literature, it's still very good, and the students uh, loved it, and they love the discussion because it's a it's a book very much about politics, and you know? it criticizes the politicians, right? All animals are equals, but some animals are more equals than others, and uh, so we have given them, and they they enjoy them. Jasmine Flores says she loved the book. And Malala, we also gave them this book, and they they also like the book, the story of this girl and. Uh, the girl who stood up for education and was shot by the Taliban in, I think it's Afghanistan. I don't remember correctly, but uh, okay. And this, these are two of my favorite books, uh, Tuesdays with Maureen. By the way, I have them here with me. And this, this one is, it's a very interesting story. Tuesday with Maureen, there's a former student who found it at a, not a garage, a garage uh, sale, but it was a secondhand store famous secondhand story in the country. And she said, she, I think she, she got it for like a, a quarter of a dollar or, or 50 cents of a dollar. And then uh, and she saw my happy face or she saw my side, then she said, I'll give it to you because I think I, I didn't have the original back then. Then I got the, it, it cost like 12 or $15 original book. Um, and then there's this other book, which is also very funny, very good. And, and, and the students love them, um, young learners. and. And, and I think it's read in high school and in, in some of also some freshmen in the United States they read it. And also our students at university have, we have been asking them to read it. It's very funny. And it's the story of this uh, Indian kid, right? Native Indian. And many of the students can relate also to the story because the story of a, of a poor kid. Diana says, Diana Rosco said that, yeah, animal farm is great for discussions, right? Thank you for the feedback. Um, so, so this is very interesting uh, book. I think we, we also used in the past this one. They just read it, and and, and it's uh, e even though these are authentic books, they did not um, uh, complain much, or they didn't. But they they enjoyed them, right? They they felt good because these are authentic books, like like I was telling you. Um, I haven't used these books uh, for a class, but there's this chicken soup series. I hope you're familiar with them. Uh, Caldo de, 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 de caldo de pollo para el alma, something like that. I think they're called. And there's chicken soup for the teenage teenager, and there's chicken soup for the mother, and there's a chicken soup for teachers. I have that chicken soup for teachers. I, I read it. Um, but once after you start reading some of them, that most of them are very familiar. We have, they are full of stories. But still, I think it's good for the learners for them to to be exposed to um, authentic material, right? To be exposed by by the books used by native speakers. Um, other books we have used or I have used in the classes, uh, we have, re I've recommended this one, uh, Nonviolent Communication by Marshall uh, Rosenberg. And, and this one, The Metamorphosis, Metamorphosis, I recently found it at a store. I think it was like $4 or $5. And uh, this is a book that brings me some memories from eighth grade. 
because we were asked to read it, but uh, I didn't understand it much when I was in eighth grade. And then I read it, I recently started reading it, and uh, although I haven't finished, but now I think I want to do it. I want to complete this task uh, from eighth grade, and I want to enjoy it. I know what the movie is about and everything, and I haven't finished it, but I, I, I bought it for myself, but also maybe I could use it in a class. Although, you know, they read it in Spanish too, right? But still, maybe the vocabulary and the analysis you can do should also be, could also be interesting. Now, what do the students think of extensive reading? What do the students think of uh, reading outside the class? Um, basically, students, some of the students tell me, some of the students are on it, they tell me, I didn't like reading because uh, they developed this trauma uh, from high school or from junior high school. They didn't develop the habit. And some of the students tell me, well, I didn't like reading, but this book could be Animal Farm, it could be Tuesday with Maury, or it could be the part time story of the Indian kid, or it could be the wimpy kid. They say, now I enjoy reading the book and I read it in one day and want, I want to continue reading more books. This is some of the feedback I get from them. And, and I see the reaction and later I see them reading books or they develop interest in reading. They see all these benefits, right? So that has been, yeah, my experience. And uh, I also have this belief that if students, um, if we don't help them develop a love for reading, love for reading for pleasure, students should not uh, hate it or feel frustrated by it. Like sometimes it happens, right? They come from high school or from junior high school and they did not, they were forced sort of to read the difficult books. And they, um, but the idea is that maybe later after the class, uh, we shouldn't frustrate them. Uh, maybe later they will read more books. Now, there's this interesting American project called the Gutenberg um, Project, and they have uploaded many books. They have uploaded many books that they say the copyrights have expired. Um, and um, let me see, these are the top 100 authors. There's a screenshot of this, uh, from this uh, project, from this site, rather. Uh, the top 100 ebooks. Um, one of them is A Christmas Carol. And actually, that's another book uh, the students have read, being a ghost story by Christmas. But they read the, the graded version, right? The Frankenstein, another uh, classic. Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. The Scarlet Letter. I think I, I showed it. My students have read it in, in the graded version. And some of the other books, uh, these are the, the top uh, top 100 books that they have, uh, the most popular books people have downloaded. Frankenstein, but Mary one more strong. Right. Um, oops, I didn't. There are more books here in this site, like I was telling you. And the, 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 the copyrights have expired. Uh, let me see, there are some of the classic books. So my, Recommendation is go hit this uh, site, gutenberg.org. Uh, um, you'll find many books in case you want to read or think of using them for your classes. Christmas Carol is, is a classic, it's a very interesting book. And it's also the graded readers. And you can you could contact the, some of the editorials in your country, maybe other teachers could have. So in conclusions, Guy, my conclusions, um, some of the conclusions have to do with uh, some of the language in the text. Students read and listen here. I, mean, I combine the two skills. Read can be acquired by them, provided that it's comprehensible input. So we don't want the, the input to be that difficult, right? We want them to be um, at their comfort level or slightly beyond, right? But not so much. And so this, they will acquire it. That's what Jeremy Harmer says. This, he also says, well, we need to provide them a lot of exposure to reading and listening, right? because students, uh, if, if we don't do this, students are unlikely to make much progress. So they need to be exposed yeah, to reading and to listening because uh, they will make progress that way. Um, the more reading and listening we give uh, to students and they can su succeed with, the better they will come at reading and listening. And, uh, here I go, I'm hammering the same idea. Students who read and listen a lot seem to acquire English better than those who do not. 
So we have to um, help the learners read and also give them listening. And some other, well, some of the conclusions, I, some of the main ideas I've been um, hammering in my presentation has to do with promote reading in and outside the classroom, find reading students could possibly enjoy. And depending on the student's level, you could use graded readers or use some of the authentic books. Thank you so much, guys, for your attention. Time for questions and comments. Okay, thank you, Mr. Carranza. We, we learn a lot with your presentation and uh, what are your suggestions? I have a question for pre-reading or what is tragedies? I, I don't wanna say the correct ones, but some that really work with you because reading is, is necessary for teachers and students and, and for the world. You know, if we read, we have vocabulary, we can understand many, many, many things will be benefit teachers and students and people who read. So how about pre-reading? What are your suggestions or comments about that? I, I think uh, one of my main uh, uh, ideas or one of my, my, my best, uh, my favorite practice is to activate students' background knowledge. Sometimes they don't have it, but if not, we have to create it, right? We have to prepare the students when they are reading something, for example, about, if they get to read about vaccines, right? The vaccination now will be very popular, right? But some people have their questions about uh, vaccines. And I, I, and I was taking a, look, you can say, you can, for example, the vaccination, right? You can, you, as a now, you can use vaccination, you can use uh, vaccine, yeah, also uh, as noun, you can use it as a verb, vaccinate, and uh, you can you can use uh, the, the informal term shot, right, the shot. And um, so we have to expose the, 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 the reader or the student to, first we need to activate them, their schematic, need to activate their background knowledge, try to get them interested in the topic. So that's, that's probably, get them interested in the topic and little by little, okay, start um, offering them some options. Okay, you have there's this book, there's this other one. So also probably um, um, find their interests. Find their interests, right? What are they interested in, right? What are, sometimes they're, they don't show it, right? But they have some, some interest. And, uh, you know, it's important also to, to find, yeah, about the pandemic. Um, how should we evaluate the reading skill uh, in the time of the pandemic? Actually, um, Teresa, the, the activities I share is one way, but of course those are tasks, but you can also have uh, the classical um, test. You can have the classical multiple choice, choice test. How to evaluate reading? Um, you can evaluate it in a classical quiz. You can use Google Forms, right, one way. And, and to, make it, to make it easy for you, you can give them the options, A, B, C, and D, right? And you grade the, the faster that way, right? That could be one way of, of evaluating reading, um, easy way, right? Give a classical test. But if a student's multiple choice, yeah, mercy. But if students can uh, connect, can have a virtual session, maybe uh, uh, a task or a book discussion could be one. But it depends on the, on the conditions or on the, the resources you have in your institution. But yes, multiple choice is one, one, one easy way to do it. Okay, thank you, uh, Jimmy. Okay, questions, comments? There are some questions on the, in the chat, okay? Uh -huh. I'm gonna read them, um, okay. Ms. Manuela Sandoval, how can we improve reading for students who don't have any knowledge of English is one. The other one is how should we evaluate the skill of reading in this time of pandemic? And how to evaluate reading? Those three questions, Mr. Carranza. Okay, uh, to the question about how to improve reading for students who don't have any English knowledge, 
Uh, that's a difficult one. But then again, I think um, finding their interest, activating their background knowledge, um, trying to make any connections uh, about the reading you have, or the reading that they would read and their own knowledge of their own uh, context can be important, uh, depending on the topic, right? But of course, you don't want to give them very difficult reading because if not, you will frustrate them, right? They will, they will hate a reading. So we have to find readings that are relatively easy in the beginning level, and particularly that that student who doesn't have any English knowledge, right? But, but I think, Manuela, if the student, if the learner is someone who likes to read, he will not be afraid of reading in English. But the problem is that they don't like to read even in Spanish. They're, they're even the, the vocabulary is limited. But then we have to work on that, right? We have to motivate them and expose them to easy but then the big challenge is finding those readings, right? Finding material, which is not that easy, right? But then how to evaluate it? I said, well, some of the tasks uh, that we use and they can, if, they, but it will depend on your resources. If they can record a video, that's great. But if not, they could, uh, um, you could have a, a multiple choice test and send it in, for example, in Google Forms or which other, whichever uh, other uh, platform you can use. Diana says some of the learners do not like to read because in basic education they were forced to read some books uh, and that, that's true sometimes they are forced to read uh, very difficult books and they don't have they don't prepare them for this okay uh, Erasmo Torres is asking me a question do you think our students don't enjoy reading because of the high use of technology and how can we motivate them to read ebooks in these pandemic times um, if you could find the books in a digital format, I have had students who read them on a, on a cell phone. Sort of a cult. But the problem is uh, if they don't read, uh, sometimes it's, they, they prefer to be on the phone, right? Maybe if we could find some books on PDF, that would be great. But if sometimes we cannot find them, right? Then we will have to, they will have to read a physical, um, a physical copy of the book, but that's a difficult question, uh, Erasmo, because uh, we have this big distraction, right? They are on the phone a, lot, a big percentage of the time, right? They are on the phone most of the time, and they don't uh, they don't uh, like to read, or they they probably say it's old fashioned. Why don't I? Why should I read it here on, on my telephone? But sometimes it's very difficult to read like uh, a book that is 50 pages or 60 pages. But if you could find it, great. Like I have had students read uh, graded books on, uh, on a, not everybody, but that could, I mean, you have to give it a try, right? Try to find them. If not, it will have to be a physical copy, but I know it's difficult, right? But um, let me see, well, I show you the, the Gutenberg project but most of those books are authentic books. Those are not graded. So it will be difficult for a learner to find uh, uh, a book for, for someone who doesn't know much English. So it's difficult. Uh, Manuela okay, Sister Carranza, yes? Ana Beatriz Echeverria is raising her hand. Ana Beatriz, did uh, you write a question, please? Thank you so much. Mr. Carranza, I want to ask you for a couple of advices because I work with uh, very young learners, the first grade, and uh, even though it's difficult for them to learn in Spanish, it's a problem of this age, these times, I, I understand that. But do you think that it could be good uh, preparing something like a warm up and introducing them to, for example, a title like Journey into the Unknown. It's just an, an idea. And telling them that we're going to to make a trip in, into the jungle and, and they're going to be very, very excited of the things that are gonna happen and they're going to be ready to to listen to the next chapter and the next chapter, and maybe it's a good way to in, to engage them to the to the reading. Well, in my opinion, I'm convinced that it starts home. But in these times, I understand that uh, everybody's working and parents are running and so on, and they're not prepared to 
like in my times, I'm a, I'm, I'm a, an old person, no? <laughs> but can you tell me an advice about it? But I, I actually, I, I like your idea. I agree with you. I mean, uh, we have to uh, prepare them mentally for the, for the reading. We have to prepare them mentally, particularly with those who don't have much knowledge, right? Yes. Like one of your partners was asking, and what you do is great. I mean, you start creating motivation, right? You're motivating them and they want to know. Although you do, you do it more like a storytelling, but with Tonsu Good, I think it's a, it's a very good start because they are, they are very young, but uh, at least ideally you will later motivate them. But of course you will need resources. You will need books, right? To expose them to, to the books. And sometimes right. it's- Pictures, colors, yes. Thank you so much. You're welcome, a pleasure. Okay. Can Listen. Yes. I would like to share an experience. Okay. Yes. So yes. I I work with some disabled students that they have dyslexia, and you know, they they don't know how to read because they have problems, brain problems. So what I did in the past, well, I worked in that school for two years or three, I think, and I read all the books to them and they started to draw what they heard and then they explained to me about the book or the magazine or the newspaper article and you know they really had problems but they progress little by little and exactly. we have many many students that don't have those problems so mm -hmm. it depends on of the teacher because we need us miss the, the lady that commented before, we need to motivate them with drawing, with pictures, with uh, a trailer, with a poster, I don't know, but we need to motivate them first. And, and that is considered sometimes like a pre reading. If we make them love and reading, they will read whatever they are <laughs> and for the rest of their lives. Exactly. Pre-reading is very important. Yeah. So yeah, the, the pre predicting, previewing, very important skill. Now, I, someone someone asked if uh, if it's a good strategy to translate the reading into Spanish. Um, sometimes, depending on the level of the learners, you can use it as a technique to make sure that they have understood um, the topic, that they have understood the main ideas. So sometimes it, translation is okay, but do not overuse it, right? Just to make sure that they have understood, you can use it. But, but it's not uh, about teaching um, English through a sort of a grammar translation, no, right? But it's just, just to make sure that the students have gotten the, the, the main idea, that's okay. You can use it as a, as a technique. Uh, and Aviatriz says, costumes to create an attractive atmosphere. Yeah, that's also another uh, great idea, bringing pictures, as some of you have said, to motivate them, right? To motivate the, the learners. Okay, more questions, comments? Let me check if there are questions in the chat. Okay. In my opinion, the reason why students don't like reading because the desire for reading is something that should be developed from the beginning of students' education and also at home. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. We, we, we teachers have to motivate them. And I think I, I read this or, or I heard this technique that we, we teachers should bring like a book to the classroom, like a different book every week. Even though probably we don't read it, but just to show a student, oh, the teacher is reading, oh, the teacher is reading different books as a, as a technique to motivate the learner, right? So I thought, I thought that's first very interesting, kind of deceiving, right? But uh, that's just to encourage them to learn. Okay, more questions. And a teacher mentioned that costumes, costumes, okay? Some teachers read first so with their students and then they present like a play, you know? Yes. And that, is, that really works. That really, 
that really works, okay? So having some place. Or, or later, right, for, for uh, as, as, as an assessment. A post, mm -hmm. as, as a post a activity, you know? Uh -huh, yeah. yeah, an activity, yes, they can dress as, as the main characters, right? As, like a recreation too. Yes. Okay, dear teacher, do you have any other question to Mr. Carranza? Please, any comment? No more questions, let me check. Excellent presentation, like a recreation. Yes, we fully agree. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much, Mr. Carranza, for your presentation. <clears throat> it was very nice. We have learned more today. Well, I I, <laughs> I felt very engaged with the books and I want to have them right now. <laughs> you know, that are different, graded books, you know, graded books. And that is very correct, important. Correct, yes. 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 yes, you need to contact the editorial, right? For, because of the copyright. Yes, so thank you very much. You're it's welcome. very, I'm very sure. important. It's very important for me take Yes, Peru Tech members and friends are very happy to have you in this international conference, okay? And we invite you for, and everybody, the, we are going to have our last conference this Saturday at 1 p.m. Mr. Leonardo Mercado from the United States and owner of NYC Learning Technologies Company will have with us will be with us this Saturday at 1 p.m. That will be our last conference. On Thursday, I think we have a webinar and on Friday we have an invitation too. So all the teachers are invited. Saturday, 1 p.m. And on Sunday is the closing ceremony of our long, very long conference because it started on August 25th and it will finish on December 20th almost four or five months we have been doing this. We have been learning a lot. And thanks God, we have awesome lecturers from around the world, from 16 countries, you know? Wow, technology <laughs> technology is perfect for us sometimes uh -huh. if we don't lose the connectivity. And we thank COVID <laughs> because we are having this conference around the world and we are learning. I am receiving a lot of comments from teachers. They are really happy because they are learning little by little and they are becoming not the best, but the, a good teacher for their students. That's the point. And the most important thing is that human beings and teachers cannot be alone. They need to be together sharing ideas, sharing knowledge, sharing books, sharing links, and maybe sharing a bad experience because we have different kind or type of students mm -hmm. and we learn how to face those problems. That's the most important thing. So dear teachers, we really say thank you again to Mr. Carranza and to you. It's almost nine, seven in we are having this conference and we have been working during the day, but it said to me, but I'm on vacation, but I'm doing volunteer work for Peru Tech. And we are eager, anxious to learn every day because we don't stop learning. And Peru Tech is always for you. So please see you this Saturday at 1 p.m. with Mr. Leonardo Mercado from the United States. And on Sunday, uh, we, we're going to have a panel on Sunday at 10 a.m. with teachers from Argentina, Brazil, Cuba, I think Honduras too, and let me see, Colombia and Bolivia also. Okay, that will be Sunday at 10 a.m. And at 11 o'clock, we will have the closing ceremony that is pre that is being prepared with a lot of love, with our hearts, with our energy. And this work is not for people that are doing this, it's for teachers, but we are learning, we are learning. Thanks a lot, Mr. Carranza. Thanks to Ms. Gracia Maria. And thanks to all the teachers that are with us tonight. 
So thank you very much and see you Thursday and Friday. Bye bye. Goodbye, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank, you. thank you so much. Good night. Bye bye, bye teachers. And thank you very much. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Thank you. See you later. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. See you on Thursday, bye. Friday, bye. Saturday, and Sunday. Bye, Mimi. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Blessing for all. Bye, Mr. Garanza. Thank bye. you very much. Selling your presentation. Bye, Mr. Miguel. Goodbye, everybody. Bye from Dominican bye, bye. Republic. Bye bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye bye. Excellent presentation. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you for for being here. Thank you.